Hi, I'm Jim Raymond, and this is the second in a series of three lectures about what I've been teaching to judges and lawyers literally all across the globe for the past few decades, and how I go about teaching it. As I mentioned in the first lecture, the title of the course is Writing for the Court, deliberately ambiguous because judges write for the court and lawyers write for the court as well. And the courses I teach are equally applicable to both. The first lecture covered what makes good legal writing good. This present lecture will be about the architecture or organization of a judgment or pleading. And I'll conclude with the next lecture, five easy steps and tips and techniques for writing an effective judgment or pleading. Whenever I ask lawyers anywhere in the world to provide an architectural metaphor for the judgments written by the highest court in that country, whatever the country happens to be, they often, in fact almost always, come up with something like, oh, they like rabbit warrens, or like a maze, difficult to find your way around, difficult to find your way in and out. My favorite metaphor to describe lots of judgments and lots of pleadings that I read would be this. It's Edinburgh Castle, you may recognize it. It's, a, it's an antique building. It's full of all sorts of antique features that no longer serve any purpose. There are parts of this building that are there simply because they have been there for centuries. Uh, and it's a building that's not designed to let people in. In fact, it's designed to keep people out. That, I think, is a good metaphor for, for, for judgments and pleadings and sometimes for legal writing in, in, gen, in general. It's a kind of useless uh, antiquity to it. And interestingly enough, when I ask judges the same question, I say, give me a metaphor for the organization of pleadings and submissions that counsel send to you. They find the same image to be equally opposite. So the legal profession is sort of odd in this wonderful way that each part of it knows what the problems are with the other part, but they, they sometimes don't recognize that they are, in fact, producing the same sort of opaque writing that they complain about when others produce it for them. So instead of this very complex building, there is a, a relatively easy solution, and it's the simple shotgun house. This is a, a structure that's very common in the part of the United States where I grew up, in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas. You've seen one, you've seen them all. They have virtually the same floor plan. They have a front porch, and they have a back porch, and they have a series of rooms all in the middle in a straight line. As corny as it may seem, this metaphor, this image, is actually a very, very helpful image for organizing virtually every judgment or pleading. And they're more complex. It can be modified to deal with more complex cases, but in fact, it's, it's generally pretty useful for virtually all of your judgments or pleadings. The front porch is the introduction. The back porch is the conclusion. And we will furnish the rooms in the middle with issues. We'll name the issues, use the issues as headings, actually, and then analyze those issues. The front porch should say who did what to whom, or who allegedly did what to whom, or in a different sort of case, who is arguing about what. And it should list the issues in a predictive order. The back porch, depending on whether you are a judge or a, or a lawyer, is a place for the recapitulation, the prayer, the remedy, the verdict, the order, the cost, and all those winding up things that generally occur at the end of a judgment. Then the middle, of course, we have to analyze and dispose of each of the issues. That is the most difficult part of judgment writing, the reasoning part. But I've come up with a couple of acronyms that judges and lawyers all over the world uh, seem to find memorable and helpful. LOP and FLOP. LOP stands for the losing party's position, and FLOP stands for the flaw in the losing party's position. And I always recommend to judges that, that once they've decided who is going to lose, they begin the analysis by expressing that position as strongly as they can, as if they were representing the losing party. If they ever find themselves diminishing or demeaning the losing party's position, they have to wonder whether they are reaching the right conclusion at the end. And then having given the losing party's position the most powerful expression you can, you then point out the flaw in that position. And the flaw is usually one of the very few things. It's the wrong law, or the wrong interpretation of the right law, or maybe there's some problem with facts or 
with the standard of proof or some procedural problem. The, if you are an attorney, you could convert these acronyms uh, for your use simply by lopping off the L's, and you, the, the lop becomes lop, the opposing party's position, and then the flop is the flaw in the opposing party's position. And if you construct a submission in this way, what you actually are doing is providing the judgment, the judge, with a draft of the judgment, as if you're saying to the judge, Your Honor, you're too busy to write this judgment here. Let me do it for you. And of course, you'd be very pleased if the judge were to accept that invitation. Of course, questions of law come in many, many varieties. The two most familiar ones are questions of fact and questions of law. But the, there is also a third category, questions of judicial discretion. And these can be further subdivided, as we do in, in the seminars. And questions of fact are a bit different, different in civil law than they are in criminal law because there are differences in the, the burden of proof and the standard of proof, and you have to attend to those when you, when you write. Questions of law come into many different varieties, and there are different techniques for analyzing each of those varieties. So what I try to do in the course is help judges and lawyers identify the nature of the question and then give them a tool that's designed to analyze that particular kind of question. Principle four for counsel, once you have the judge's attention on your submission, do not send him or her anywhere else, least of all to the opposing party's submission. And principle four for judges, you can never make the losing parties happy but you can make them feel heard, and that's a very important consideration. If you've lost a case, if a client, if a, if a party has lost a case, nothing is worse than going away feeling that the judge never even heard your argument. That's why the law part is extremely important for judges. Express the losing party's position in the, as if you were representing the losing party. Otherwise, you are diminishing the respect that people have for the courts. They just feel bewildered and have no idea why they have lost. So much for architecture. The next lecture will be five easy steps and very practical tips and techniques for, for writing and organizing your judgments and your pleadings. I'll conclude with principle five. Theory is easy. I don't think there's anything complicated about what I've said so far. It's just common sense, although sometimes it seems like radical common sense because it is so much at variance with the, with the tradition of legal writing. Theory is easy. Anyone can say, oh, it's easy to, to play golf. You just take this club and hit that ball straight ahead and knock it into a hole a few, a few hundred yards away. Yeah, try it. Nothing to it. It's the same thing about writing. The theory of how to write well is very, very easy, but the practice, the practice takes hard work, a bit of humility, and a lot of constructive coaching. And if you feel that you're up for some of this constructive coaching, in addition to lots more examples and hints and tips that I, I'm prepared to give you in a seminar, consider coming to one of the programs that we have already scheduled. And I'd like to do them in interesting places. There'll be one in New York and, and, and one in uh, New Orleans. The one in New York will be at the National Arts Club, right on Gramercy Park, and the one in New Orleans will be at the Royal Sinesta Hotel in the Vieux Carré. So consider joining us. You can find all the details on my website, and you can find, of course, more information about my own credentials in the same place. Look forward to meeting you in either of those places.